Today I'm joined by Pyotr Hatchek. Pyotr is double Olympian, double Olympic finalist, uh, competed in the 1996 Olympic Games and 2000 Olympic Games, representing Poland in track and field. Amongst the biggest achievements, world champion 1994 in the 4x400 meter relays and world indoor champion in 2001 in the 4x400 meter relay. Welcome, Piotr. Welcome. Piotr, after your career, you also moved into coaching and you've been national coach in different countries like Scotland, Denmark and Poland. Is that correct? Yes. And actually, when I retired, I started work with the disabled people, Paralympians. And actually, that was not short, one and a half year. And actually, it was funny because I'm coming from the running events. And actually, I have biggest success with the shot putter, who actually still, still follow the career of the guy who was coming. It was double amputant. And uh, he won some Paralympics medals mm -hmm. a few times. He was the world champion. But that was when I started in the, as a coaching career with disabled. And after I threw the clubs, different clubs, different federation. I was coaching people, mentoring people, doing different roles in the track and field. Okay. And if you look back at your two Olympics, which one was the better experience, the 1996 Atlanta or the Sydney one? You know, when I was 96, it was all, only not more than three years when I was on the athletics career. I started to compete, compete train 93. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very quick uh, progress. And it was surprising I will go to the 96 to the Olympics. And I think so it was more funny for me and enjoyable Atlanta. Sydney was different approach. I'm coming for the second Olympic with different approach when I go to the first one. And also we as a group, as a 4x4 team, we come with a completely different approach in 96. When after a lot of years, no relays was from the Poland, even we have good memory. From the past uh, for the relays, and 96 was like rebuild of the new generation of the 400 runners in the Poland. It was first Olympic after many years. Then uh, Sydney was actually completely different approach with the group when we are prepared four years very strictly. I may maybe talk later about that, but uh, it was more professional way I go to the to the Sydney with with mindset program it to to make the success. Hmm. Okay. And then if you look back at your athletic career, what was your darkest moment? Yeah, I will say actually the Sydney was darkest moment. Okay. Because uh, after Olympic 96, uh, we know that our coach actually approach was that individually we will have difficult to get the medals. So we start to focus on the relays a lot because we know we will develop individually as well because there was the group of the guy and as always only four sports so you need to be in the top shape to go and we spent uh, four years up to olympics we sacrifice a lot we sacrifice family lives we spend almost thousand days for the four years to go to training camps competition everything so the social life and family life was gone and we've been ready to the two seasons, 98, 97, 99, or even 97, show we are on the good progress to make the good results. In 98, we made the 258, which was surprise. Results for us was fourth in the history this time. And 99, we got the medal in the Sevilla, which was silver, but was upgraded later to the gold. And we know we're ready to, to fight in the Sydney. And what's happened? In the final, actually, one of my colleagues made the mistake. We've been on the line eight in the final. He made mistake. He go during the change. He go out, and the organizer made mistake because they left the boxes with the number close to the track, and he hit that, holding down, doing what we call the uh, tiger jump, and start to running again. And when you're looking the times from from the splits. When the guy, normally we run much faster than individual, and the guy who actually was number five in the final, he ran 46-4. And next guy ran 46-4-5. And I ran on, only 45-2, which was average for me, because normally I run last ten, five, uh, four years 44-6 or faster. 
splits. Mm. And we know from that point of view, that was the, the darkest moment. We lost the medal chance. We know we can get the medal, not easy, but we will, we will get this medal with the good fight. And what the medal give to the us, because the um, Polish ru uh, rules actually say, when you get the Olympics medal, you get life pension. Okay. So kind of stability for the future, we, we will say, yeah. in the mind. So for the athletes, it's a nice place. That was a dark moment when, when you say you sacrifice a lot and you're losing that in, like, in the seconds. But, you know, that's happened. That's life. That's, that's the brutality of the sports. And how did you recover from that moment? You know, actually, I'm very quick go forward. I have called, I think, so three hours after I spoke with my girlfriend this moment. Uh, this time it was now with my wife. And she was trying to explain me that life is not ending with that. I said to her, you know what? That was yesterday. Now is the new day and, and we, we go forward. And that's the sport. I know we can change anything now. Doesn't matter that the box was on the track or not on the track. We will not change the results, nothing. And you know, that's, that's the sport. You need to understand and you need to accept that sometimes even you're expecting something, you're ready for something that something may, can happen what is out of your control. And, you know, no one was blaming this guy, my colleagues. I remember straight after run, we go to the changing room and, and we just said to him, don't care about that. That's finished. It's nothing happened now. And, you know, always that sitting in us. I think so. I saw today this, uh, I watched this race after 15 years, first time today before we interview and I want to see what's actually because it's sitting in some sometimes in the back head but you know I'm not caring about that mm. and we actually re recover as a group of much much quick fast after that because only 162 days after that we won the world indoors so that was actually confirmation we've been ready to get these medals fight for these medals but that's happened yeah <laughs> And what happened in uh, 2004? You guys did not qualify? Uh, we didn't qualify. I actually retired in 2003. Okay. Uh, some of the guys was injured. And I think so. that was the biggest problem with the, the group in 2002-2003. We didn't get that good support from maybe federation, but not regarding the preparation, regarding the consolidated what we have, mental uh, support or that kind of stuff when you say, okay, it's not over what was 2000. You still have time, all of you. And, and I think so that's, that's the federation need to look in, in the future. And that's the problem with some federation. You know, you underperform maybe two, one, two years and people say, okay, it's gone. We're looking for the new guys. And, And actually, because the period four years, every one of us sacrificed something, study or, or life. Most of us wants to actually do something different. And 2003, I guess I had some injury problem and I decided, okay, I, I want to fa finish my uni and I want to move on to the other thing in my life. Hmm. Okay. Well, what was your best moment? Best moment? You know, that, that's difficult to say because it was a lot of great moments I have uh, since 94, I will say, to 2001 when I competed last time in the international championships. But, but my, my biggest moment, I will say, it was my first Polish championships under 18. When I come as a no one, I'm actually start to train athletics uh, late 93. And I qualify for the under 18 uh, Polish championships. But the biggest problem for me was my coach who was coming from, uh, my first coach who came from the um, uh, military forces, special forces. We didn't expect I will be progress so fast. So he arranged for me some parachuting camp and I should uh, go with the soldiers doing some fun. He want to make me something fun and I want to stick with him in the sports and physically improve. But unfortunately, I, unfortunately, I qualify for the um, under 18 Polish championships and I get invitation to regional squads, pre-camp, 
And I went there, I trained a little bit, I had some fun with the camp as a young uh, person. And I come to this competition with no expectation. And some people who was leading our team, my coach wasn't there. They said, oh, he's just coming, running and go home. And I qualify for the finals for the first stage. And everyone said, okay, that's, that's tough. That's, that's not more. The funny thing, I won it, this championships by 300s. I think so in the 700 seconds was fifth guy. So it was a very tough race. The time was 49.99. So I break first time in my life, 50 seconds. So I joined the club with the big four on the front. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's maybe what I need to do. Maybe I need to look in more in athletics. Mm. That was like biggest moment, the opening door for my life, actually, because I never thinking I will go to the university with the sports or that kind of stuff. But that's actually changing all of for me because I get invited to national squads uh, camps preparation and from 94 to 95 I make good progress and 96 I make the time which actually give the qualification for the relay so that, that's that's the progression was fast and I think so that's the biggest moment what I will always remember hmm. and not about the big sometimes the medals it's about the small which actually open it and I will say this moment change my life uh, until now because I'm in mean, the sports involved all the time now. Hmm. And then before 93, what did you do in terms of sports? No, you know, I was ordinal a uh, teenager. Yeah. I, I played some soccer, when I, uh, football when I was 10, 11, 12. Nothing more. I play some volleyball in the school. I actually want to play volley more volleyball than I uh, want to do athletics. But uh, I spend time with my friends outside playing football, going... Uh, I, I live in a small uh, town south of the Poland. We have very close access to the mountains. So we spend a lot of time lying in the mountain side. Hmm. Climbing, running, uh, catching... Uh, everything what you can do it as a teenager when... No iPads, no computers this time. <laughs> Nothing. It's it was a different time. <laughs> it was a different time, you know. We know what is the uh, finger to grip the tree or something like that. But, but that's, that was the life, what we get. And, uh, you know, do the physical challenge almost every day to get something fun from your free time from the school. But also education, physical education in school was on different level, I would say, yes? We can do a lot of gymnastic, acrobatic, playing all the games and everything. So mm -hmm. that was fun. I actually always enjoying uh, going to the physical education in the school from the very early stage to the very late stage. So that was, I always been involved in the sports, but not professionally, not training the, some clubs and nothing like that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so if you could travel back in time, 10, 15, maybe now, 20, 25 years, what advice would you give a younger Piotr? You know, 20 years back, I will say get find good mentor, learn from his mistakes, ask him what you, how he will do something, what you expecting it something happen. I think so that will be the best benefit for me if I have that I have few people who mentoring but I think so they haven't been ready this time to that that kind of the personality when I was to that of the group what we was and therefore I trying now when I work with the young people to actually give them experience what I got in, in my 40 years life to give them don't make mistakes prepare It's about you, it's not about me. And that was, that's the big advice I would give myself. Find a good mentor who knows everything. How would you go about it? That's an interesting one. How would you find a mentor? What would be the steps you take? You know, I think so. We, I, I've been uh, unlucky maybe in this generation, Polish athletics, when actually we come back after the communist time and was not many big stars. We have... Uh, 
and uh, the, the generation which was actually before, I think so the gap between us was too big. And, uh, you know, Federation didn't actually in this time have something like that, providing us the guidelines. We actually been lucky we have kind of the mental coach. We was one, one of our physio who come, uh, he come from the Belarus, actually. He was more physiotherapist than mental coach, but he started to work with us with the mental side and we develop very strongly this kind of part of uh, our skills, but it wasn't guiding as a mentoring. It was part of it, what we developed. M mentoring, you know, my coach trying to tell me something like that, I do. But when the, uh, I will say, when we start to argue with something, I think so he wasn't equipped well with the communication skills and that the conflicts coming. Hmm. You know, on the end of the, my career, I have big conflicts with my uh, coach, national coach and my coach. Very big conflicts. We go as a not friend, never ever. Whoa. But it's take one year after we speak and we speak uh, now regularly every week or twice. I'm trying helping him to not make some mistakes. <laughs> what, we, what we did, you know, and we're good friends, you know, but I think so because I was that kind of character, very strong, very young, unexperienced on some areas, and he was unexperienced in some areas, and we didn't find good solution in some, uh, some conflicts, and, and that's maybe was when I uh, very early stopped the career, because I didn't feel comfortable in something, then I went out. So, so, so mentoring, mentoring guidelines, mentoring is nice words, but, but some guidelines who, who can help you or you can find the experience from the people who been in this situation can handle this situation, can help you with something. That is the best, best advice for the, for the people. Always look for someone who is smarter or maybe not smarter, know something more than you know. Hmm. Get this one, 1,000% 1, of this knowledge to you. What are the habits that make you a successful athlete or person? Habit? Oh, <laughs> you know, I never been afraid uh, for opponents. And I think so that's also creating the mental training when we prepare, visualize all the scenario. But also success, I always uh, perform much better when it was tougher. When the challenges, unexpected challenges actually coming. And that actually in a very late stage of my career, I make some uh, psychological tests, which actually confirm that in normal circumstances, I will do just 90, 80% of my capacity. When actually it will be tougher, harder, unexpected, I do 130. Hmm. So, so, and my habits was, okay, I need to find the challenge always. Therefore, for example, my coach, always try and put me when we need to fight on the relay body by body. When you need to push someone, sometimes get the space in the rules and you get good position. And I always pass my, we always say I have my PhD with the elbows fighting on the track. Hmm. So, so that was what actually bring me up to be successful. And I always looking for challenges in life. I'm always going to uncomfort zone because I'm feeling there comfortable. Still today? Still today. Still today. I, I you know, too easy for me is too boring sometimes. <laughs> And therefore, I try to always find, okay, where, where is the challenge? When I'm feeling, actually, I not needed adrenaline. I needed to do something. I need to improve myself actually clearing this challenge. Because too easy is like, okay, you don't know almost nothing. You can sleep. Do you have a morning routine? How did you get ready for the day or how do you get ready for the day at the moment? At the moment. Or as an athlete, did you have a morning routine? Yeah, as a, as a morning routine, normally we do, we have some morning session yoga or stretching or some walk or breathing exercise, which we do a lot. As a now, as a person I do, when I wake up, I'm thinking about the last few days, the challenges that I have. 
Should I expect something coming in the future? Or what I learned from these challenges? Can I bring something to what I'm doing now or passing uh, to the POD next day, which will be easier or maybe each easier? It will help others and, uh, and make much smoother life. So, so I try to review what I do. I try to always self-criticize myself, finding, okay, what I do wrong in the last few days. Hmm. Okay. So how do you prepare for important moments? For important moments. In the sports, you know, we try to make the plans, everything. But I said, plans, plans are plans, lives are lives. So I never st stick with the plans. If something happened, you know, you can make ABC, but uh, I always prepare. Okay. If something happened in the theory of the chaos, you need to also be prepared. And uh, I try to put the date, what, how it will be, what can I face, which kind of challenges I can face it, who I need to speak with, what I needed clear before that is not hanging on me and go on. And for those who are not fully familiar with track and field, the 400 meters is one of the most grueling events, right? So when you get ready for a competition, you know that there has to be a large amount of suffering. That can make people scared or that can make you go towards it. How did you deal with that? You know, I think so. That that's more, more scary when you're doing a session. Self-competition is not that hard. You're coming, as I said, we do a lot of mental training, breathing exercise, relaxation. So one of the, one of the things what I always uh, say to the people, when I was first time in Atlanta, uh, in Olympics Atlanta, when I went to the qualification, relay qualification, and I think so was 80,000 people in the stadium. I'm only here when the people touch the track on the spikes when they run. I didn't hear this a lot of voices from the people USA, USA, never, ever. I've been completely switched off and I focus what I need to do. I need to run fast. That's it. I need to get the good uh, changeover with my colleagues. That's it. So, so, so we're programming and, and, I, and I do a lot, as I said, mental, uh, mental training, we do a lot of visualization. Mm -hmm. so, so that training help us to move us to other stage, the mentally. And uh, therefore, I said, we never been afraid about the opponents. Even we know they are better, but we know we better as a group. We have actually, when we go on the track, we always go on the four, uh, hands on the shoulder. That was our tradition to go and see, okay, we are as a stone, we are as a group. I can see now as a Polish team doing that again, the four by four, the guys, this is more conflict. So that's kind of the problem. We've been as a tough group. We've been tough person. But we've always been ready to, to fight. We never give something for free to others. Hmm. Uh, and I said, this, this mental training, we do that individually, but mainly we do it also as a group together. And we see what you can do in a lot of different challenges we do. What people say, oh, this is something like a hocus pocus. <laughs> but, you know, I think so before final, you know, semi-final in Atlanta, because Atlanta was three rounds, the same was uh, Sydney. Not like now only two runs in the relay and you go on. That was three runs. It was tougher a little bit. And I think so we get uh, after the quarterfinal. Yes, after quarterfinal, because it was two runs in the one day, we got the mental session together. And after that session, I remember when we went out from the beds, all of us, if someone said you need to go through the wall, all of for us, we go through the wall. We win so good set to what we need to do it. So we have some very good routine with that. Hmm. Cool. How do you overcome setbacks? What do you do if things don't go your way? Life is gone. You need to go forward. The same what I said with the Sydney, when it was the biggest, darkest moment, you know. Uh, life is not ended with setbacks. You need to look into the new sunshine next day and i have some some uh, my motto what i actually using sometimes at uh, when you're celebrating your success 
is kill you. No, when you're celebrating too long, it's killing you success. Mm. So you need to stop celebrating the success very quick. Always remember that is the next day, next sunshine, by only belief you can do it. That's what we've been bringing or given to, to, by sports, by our coaches, by people who are surrounded, who are working with us. And that's actually uh, the sentence developed through the years when I work in the sport, when I was athletes, on my personal life. Don't uh, celebrate success too much because the skill you next, uh, don't celebrate too long mm. because it's kill you next success, chance to kill you next success and uh, sunshine is always coming for you. You only need to believe yourself. You can do it. Mm. Cool. Who's your role model and why? You know, that, that's the tricky question. As a young athlete, no invo starting in the sports, I was looking at Roger Black, guy from the UK, 44 something, but it never was like role model. I think so role model for me was more the coaches who I worked with and my parents. And why? Because actually they developed the skills for me and they developed, they helped me develop to be so independent and make decisions by own. So actually when you as an athlete or someone staying with the challenge on your own, you're ready to make the uh, decision. You're not looking to someone to helping you. And I, I think so that was the role models they develop. They give me the advices through the life and through the sports that be independent and be ready to self-make decision. My parents never actually trying to involve uh, direct me in the sports, never ever. And that's what is the, I think I will say, the one of the biggest thing what I get from them. They've been supported somewhere, but they never go to blending what I need to do in the sports, how I need to do in the sports. I very quickly moved from uh, uh, family houses, or oh, that's it, and I'm being independent when I was 19. I start to travel a lot and everything, you know. That was the, I would say that is the role model for the coaches, for their parents, because now I see everyone to do for everyone. <laughs> and athletes are, are coming and say, what do I need to do now? I have some situation with the athletes in... 2017 in London, when I got debriefing after competition, the athletes told me the problem, biggest problem for to not perform was the toilet was five meters for long, uh, too far from the color room. I said, where we are? <laughs> And we, we, we are not to uh, make everything for the athletes. They need to do own decision, uh, ownership for almost everything. Yeah. Now, services, everything cool. That's fine. That's we live in this generation when people want to be served mm. from, from open the door to close the door. <laughs> What is the best advice you received and who gave it to you? This is the part of this, what I tell uh, you early, that uh, don't celebrate the success too long. When the medals is hanging on your neck, And when you're coming down from the podium, that's the end of the story. You need to think in the next uh, step. And that's, that's what I always bring in to the athletes. We make the first step, we need to go through. You know, that will be in the books forever, but it will be not in books forever that you're celebrating along. Hmm. The next success will build your portfolio. And uh, that, that's, that's the one of the biggest advice what I bring in and I always trying to push to the others don't be too much happy with the success because everyone will look when you success once everyone mm. will success another once and if you success once not many people will remember you and how is it received by the athletes the idea of moving on quickly I think so some athletes understand it And I think so with them who I actually work, who I mentor it, and coaches who I work, who actually go this with that, you can see they're progressing. 
and they not uh, step out of the boxes very early when they have uh, setbacks. They know, okay, we need to work further on the success and the success have always ups and downs. And, and for them who celebrate too long, they thinking they will be easier to bring them back after the success is not, is not. So, and they think they can do everything what they did before the first one. No, no, life is changing very quick. Sports is brutal and you need to be ready to next day to, to meet the opponents who are actually smarter than you. And you need to be always smarter than they are. Hmm. That's the quote of this. Um, my son told me a few days ago, and I remember the quote of the, of the lion and the gazelle that is getting up, right? Both have to run fast. The one has to survive and the, to survive and the other one to get food. So Exactly. Yeah. So back in the days, how did the typical training day look like? Oh, if, if I coming back to this period, normally period when we was 96 to 90, 2000, when we spent a lot of uh, days in training camps around the world. So we started, the route, our routine was starting 7.30, doing some, depends of the day, stretching, yoga or breathing exercises, half hour to be just wake up or maybe make some uh, movement in body. Then we go to the breakfast. Then normally depends who, but for me, I always go to the power nap again. And uh, 45 minutes after the breakfast, then we go to the first session, which was always main session. Or depends of the day, it was endurance, weights, uh, speed or whatever. Then uh, we have some uh, rest, dinner, some social, maybe power nap if someone needed. Then we do the second session normally. Then we do have some time for physio if it's necessary, some physiologist, uh, some uh, psychologist. Then dinner, then we have time to rest or follow the physio and time to sleep. I'm actually as an athlete sleep a lot, a lot. I'm spending a lot of time in, uh, sleeping a lot actually some of my friends never <laughs> believe that i can sleep so much atlanta was like that i can sleep atlanta actually was the days when i sleep 14 16 hours it was for me training sleep waiting because the relay was last three out three weeks late waiting to the competition it was okay i don't want to spend time uh, on the social life three three weeks and be mentally out no no That, that's that's but but normally that was routine for the day and and for the week we have 10 session during the week without this morning i will say and without the mental session so that was normal routine we have 10 sunday always was always free almost always free for us and saturday uh, wednesday we have one training and saturday we have one training hmm. which was the toughest uh, endurance runs On Saturday? Saturday and, Saturday and, and Wednesday. Hmm. So we have two, two tough endurance training. Okay. I didn't like 500s and we, we have Saturdays there was 500s in the blocks of the periods. I didn't like it that because I come from the speed side. But when you're ready, you enjoy it. When you're not ready, when you're starting <laughs> the season, you will not enjoy it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> or depends of the period we have also some uh, e very early stage november october we spend some time in the mountains in polish mountains we do some long runs in the mountains long walk, walk runs 20 30 40 kilometers winter time is actually when we come in after indoor season straight after competition two three weeks times in the mountains when we love it when not now because not now is a lot of snow in this time, but 20 years ago, when you're going uh, for the long run uh, training, 30 kilometers in one meter snow, it was not maybe fun. <laughs> but it was tough, but it was actually nice. I believe that. <laughs> Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? You know, when we're talking about nominate, nominate someone from out of the my sports, I try to the very, very um, far, 
So actually, I will go for the winter sport. Mm -hmm. I will go for the guy who is not Polish, even winter. Uh, but this, this sport in Poland is very crazy on winter. So it will be ski jumper. Andreas Kittel. Okay. Actually, he lives in Denmark. He, he doing some PhD and uh, actually doing some interesting stuff about uh, elite athlete mental health. Mm. So it will be nice to hear from here. Successful guy. He's been on the Olympics winter. But, uh, you know, that will be interesting because Polish ski jumping is on the top of the world. I don't want to uh, nominate someone from Poland as we, as we talk. <laughs> I don't want to nominate someone from 400. I want to go far away. It will be more fun for the people to, to follow up. Oh, that's really cool. Where can people find you? Uh, normally, I may exist on the LinkedIn, but when I open my self-consultancy, I have my website uh, when people can contact me. I do different things around the sports from consulting strategy, but to the preparation, training, or that kind of uh, website is P-I-O-H-A.com. So first three letters from my name and uh, two letters from our surname. That's it. Okay. Okay. And we talked briefly before that interview, you said you wanted to introduce some principles from high performance sports into your consultancy business. Can you elaborate yeah. on that? You know, I think so. When we're looking on the market, when we're looking uh, actually on the two sides of the life, the business and sports, we can see how much the business side, the mental coaches, the mentoring or different things pushing to the sports side. But if you look in the other side, sport, sport is not pushing a lot to the businesses. When I believe businesses can learn a lot from the sports people, actually how to operate, how to prepare, how to operate in the chaos, <laughs> uh, how to plan something, a strategy, cooperation with the others. So it's a lot of which actually can be influenced both sides. But I still see the business trying to push much more then we from the sports side, we need to push business a little bit more also. And how is it received in your consultancy business? You know, I, I speak with different people and, and uh, always interesting when you're hearing people from the business side, they can't believe it what actually people in the sport sometimes doing to achieve the success. How they sacrifice, how they make the plans, how plans are actually complicated sometimes and sometimes how they are very simple hmm. because when you overcomplicate it, you can maybe lose <laughs> the meaning of the approach or goals. <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's interesting discussion when we have always. And from the business side, you can see how we can learn exactly, for example, communication, develop that kind of skills in the coaching hmm. because we are far, far away from good communication skills. And I will see, When we approach old, old uh, generation coaches, approach the new generation athletes. That's the, that's the, that's the, when the gaps start to be bigger, 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 that will be tougher for both sides. Yeah. Okay. Piotr, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. No worries. That was interesting. Yeah, it was. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks. Thank you.